So I, I'm trying to see how many familiar faces there were from the last hour to see how much we should review. But I'll just um, go lightning quick through some of the stuff we talked about in the overall lecture and then dig into some of the physics um, for those of you who I can't wait to hear about that. So the big picture, um, and I, here it says yesterday for when I was sitting in LaGuardia, so of what we talked about an hour ago, um, is that the universe started. Um, this R4 dimensional universe came from somewhere. And the theory is that there was an inflationary epoch when the universe was something like 10 to the minus 35 seconds old, um, during which the universe increased in size by many orders of magnitude, and during which um, microscopic quantum fluctuations were stretched to macroscopic size, laying the seeds for the formation of um, the structure that we see in the universe today. The CMB is our best tool for understanding what those fluctuations look like and what the conditions overall in the uni early universe were. It was emitted when the universe was 380,000 years old. And it's a bath of photons that pervade the universe that we can see in our detectors today. Um, followed, um, following the CMB was a period of what we call the Dark Ages, before the formation of structure. Um, then there's something we call reionization, when the first stars turn on, about about 500 million years. Then, since then, structure has been forming in the form of these filamentary structures, clusters, and voids um, to the modern universe today, um, which is about 13.7 billion years old. Um, so just to spend a lightning quick review of the kinds of cosmological measurements that we have been doing to get to this overall framework in understanding what the big picture of the history of the universe looks like. So there's been enormous, enormous progress over the last um, half century to century. And it's really only in this time that the picture of modern cosmology has taken shape. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few notable discoveries. There's a zillion um, really, really, really important pieces of work that we're not going to talk about. So, but just to give you a, a gestalt of the kind of thing. So you know, really, um, one of the most important discoveries was um, in the late 1920s when Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding. And that was through observations of galaxies moving away and um, demonstrating that the further away a galaxy is, the fastest, faster away it is, is moving. And the conclusion was that the universe is expanding. And the hypothesis then was, well, if the universe is expanding, what was it expanding from and what should it have looked like a long time ago? Um, and that led to the proposal that there should be a cosmic microwave background and the subsequent de detection and characterization of that light, um, both in the initial detection through the Penzias and Wilson um, experiment and then the more detailed characterization from the COBE satellite that flew in 1990. Um, so let's get into the physics of the cosmic microwave background. So it's a baby picture of the universe. We talk about that in the, in the big picture lecture. But what is it that we can measure? Um, we measure temperature, the, the overall temperature. We measure differences, spatial differences in the temperature. And we can measure polarization. So those are kind of our big picture tools. Um, so what have we measured? <clears throat> the temperature has been characterized exquisitely well. The COBE instrument measured the temperature to 2.725 plus or minus 0 0.002 Kelvin. And notice that the black body characteristic that was proposed through the thought experiment of imagining what the universe would have looked like had an overall expansion just been run backwards in time to when the universe behaved like a plasma, the proposal was that you should see the type of characteristic emission from a plasma, i.e. black body radiation. And indeed, this is, this is what was seen, a perfect black body. Um, so the question is, what was going on in the universe at the time that this radiation was emitted? And what can we learn about the state of matter of the universe from the observations of the cosmic microwave background, and therefore something about the initial conditions, about the history, about the development, about the formation. So, so let's just think about what, the, what we call the photon baryon fluid. So when the universe is extremely hot and dense, 
It's too hot and dense for neutral hydrogen atoms or any neutral atoms to form. And the result of that is that the photons are what we call tightly coupled um, to the electrons. So Thomson scattering prevents the photons from getting away. So as soon as they are emitted, they scatter, they are re-emitted, and you have this optically thick fluid. Um, and the electrons are coupled to the positive nuclei through the Coulomb interaction, and the universe is optically opaque. Okay, so it's like the material um, inside, um, in the interior of, of stellar objects. So what's interesting in the early universe, though, if you think about these kinds of conditions, and you think about quantum mechanical seeds laying down fluctuations in the density, then what you can imagine is that um, if you buy for the moment the idea that you had this incredibly rapid expansion that happened essentially instantaneously, which means that your background of density fluctuations are locked in, in a pattern. Okay? And then you imagine thinking about, as a thought experiment, what would it look like if you were in one of these denser regions? Okay, so what you would have is you have this photon baryon fluid represented here by the potential well of gravity and the photon um, pressure as springs. Okay, so you have this fluid that's being pulled into gravitational wells. The photon pressure builds up, the, and then it expands. And then as the photon pressure decreases through the expansion, then the gravitational pull starts to win again, and it starts to contract. Okay, so you get what are called acoustic oscillations in the photon baryon plasma. And the weight of the baryons provides this inertial drag, and the potential wells are formed primarily out of dark matter. So the baryons are not driving the density fluctuations. This is something we did not know a priori, but you can extract from the careful measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So what's interesting, and what's, it's kind of hard to get your head around this, but the idea here is that the oscillations are temporally coherent. So in other words, the inflationary epoch happens rather quickly, so that the oscillations start at a punctual time. And they're spatially incoherent, as you would expect from having been laid down through quantum mechanical fluctuations. So what you imagine seeing is on every spatial scale up to the sound horizon of the universe, you will see potential wells. And this would be the, what we would call the fundamental, the very largest one that's, the, that's set by the size of the universe. And then over time, you will see, and then, and then there's, there are ones that are related by, you know, in, a, in a harmonic series, and, but also all the other ones, okay? So you have this, you can't represent every single one, so I've just represented a few. And at any given time, you will see that all of the different sizes will oscillate at different frequencies depending on their size. And at any given moment, you will have all of the different states. Okay, so what you see here is, if you imagine the yellow balls are the starting conditions, so that's where everybody is right after inflation. And then you see a compression, and this mode has compressed maximally. This mode has compressed and expanded, and there are all of the ones in between, right? There's one medium size that's compressed only to here. And then here, this is the one that's related to the one before, compressed, expanded, compressed. And this one's compressed, expanded, compressed, expanded. And again, all of the ones in between. And there's nothing special about any particular one. So from the end of inflation, as the universe starts to expand and cool, you get this behavior on all scales, this oscillating um, baryon acoustic oscillation behavior. Um, so what's interesting there? So what happens through this whole period of time, this photon baryon fluid is just oscillating, 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 not, in, not particularly interesting. And at the same time, the universe is expanding. And through the expansion, you get it, it's cooling. So for the first 380,000 years, 
you get a separation of fundamental forces, you get the creation of various types of particles, you get some interesting things happening, but more or less, it's kind of a boring time because the universe is just mostly expanding. But when the universe drops above about 3,000 Kelvin, um, neutral hydrogen atoms begin to form. The mean free path for scattering drops precipitously and the photons decouple. And so they are at that moment allowed to free stream throughout the universe. So the acoustic oscillations stop because as things are being drawn into the potential wells, the oscillations, remember, are being driven by the photon pressure pushing back out. When the photons escape, there is no more pressure pushing back out. And you start to see a condensation in those potential wells that's no longer oscillating. So a couple of things happen. So now comes the slightly tricky part. When the acoustic oscillations end, it picks out a preferred set of scales. Okay, and the reason for that is that at a particular time, at any particular moment, there will be a largest scale that has had time from the end of inflation to now, whenever now happens to be, to have compressed once. And then there will be the ones in between, and then there'll be the one that has had time to compress and rarefy, and so on. And that particular set of scales gets picked out at the moment at which the photons escape. Okay. And these modes, you can write down what they are. They have particular wavelengths and wave vectors, and they correspond to particular angle scales on the sky at that moment when the photons escape. So the maximally compressed and rarefied regions, they are the hottest and coldest regions in the microwave background. And so when you look at a picture of these, of these fluctuations, they appear as the hot and cold spots, the bright spots in the microwave background. And already with your eye, um, we'll talk about the various scales, but with your eye, you can pick out a characteristic size of these dots. There's a dominant angular scale at which these fluctuations appear that your eye can pick out right away. And, and we'll sh I'll show you statistically how you characterize that and what it's telling you about all of the different cosmological parameters that you can start to extract. So coming back to the question, what can we measure? Okay, first you can measure the temperature, the black body temperature, and then you can measure temperature differences. So here are maps taken from the COBE satellite, which was launched in 1989, and you can see the temperature monopole. So this is the 2.73 Kelvin. And then if you subtract off the monopole, you get the dipole. Okay, this dipole is kind of cool. If you think about it, this it represents our motion through the local group. So this is our motion the motion of our Earth, but also our solar system and our galaxy through relative to the cosmic microwave background. And that is driven by the large scale, but still local gravitational interactions that are moving us with respect to the mean flow of the background universe. And then if you subtract this off, you get something that looks like this. And this is the galaxy. So it's a big, bright blob that's right in the middle of what you're trying to look at, and we'll come back to that later. And if you subtract that off, then you see this first picture of those um, fluctuations. Now, you'll notice that the characteristic size you're seeing here is a, a lot larger than the characteristic size I showed you here. And the reason for that is that the angular resolution of this experiment was not good enough to resolve all of these blobs, so it, it blurred them. It was like before you have your glasses on. And so the WMAP satellite, which flew roughly 10 years later, had higher resolution, was able to pick out those finer features. The most recent satellite, the Planck satellite, you can see even finer features. Um, 
And you can see the dominant fluctuations are still on the same scale. So you're still seeing the same dominant scale of fluctuations, but you can see a lot of like grainier structure in there. You can start to see what's happening on smaller and smaller angular scales. So it's fine to look at these, and they look kind of pretty, especially if you're a physicist. But you're not going to learn anything quantitative from studying the maps. So if you're a physicist, the first thing you'll think is, well, you just Fourier transform it, obviously, right? Because that's what physicists do whenever they have any problem, right? So what does that mean? Um, so you can describe these patterns in what we call L space, um, or in terms of spherical harmonics. So you write a temperature, you write these temperature fluctuations on the sky as an expansion of the spherical harmonics with coefficients YLM and ALM, <clears throat> coefficients ALM corresponding to each of these, blah, blah. So you determine what this coefficient is for each value of L, and it tells you how much power is on that angular scale. Okay? So it's, it's a simple spherical harmonic decomposition for those of you who are familiar with that. So these are the equations in colors that are not particularly helpful, so I apologize. Um, and, but the basic idea is that you can compute how much power there is, how much fluctuation power, so how much, how much power in variation there is, different power between two locations, as a function of this quantity L, okay, which L is basically how big your angular scale is. So as you go this way, you're probing smaller angular scales. And as you go this way, you're probing larger ones. And this is how much power. So for two very large blobs, that's how much power you would measure corresponding to blobs placed down in various places of roughly that size. And then as you get to smaller and smaller, your power that you're measuring moves out. And the, the scales you're probing get smaller, and so on. So what this looks like when you actually do this measurement on the microwave background, you do the spherical harmonic transform and you get something that looks like this. Okay, so you can see this big giant peak right here is the, peak, is the angular size at which your eye immediately picks out all of that power. Right? So you're picking out all of that power is at about a degree on the sky. And this L of about 200 corresponds to a degree on the sky. So the spherical harmonic transform is telling you what your eyes are telling you, that that's where all the power is. But it's also showing you a whole bunch of other stuff that's going on there. So if you look, if you go through all of the detailed mathematical calculations, you discover that the even peaks here correspond to the compression maxima. The odd peaks correspond to the rarefaction maxima. And all of the uh, measurements in between correspond to all of those modes that are neither fully compressed nor fully rarefied. Okay, so what you're mapping out by looking at this angular power spectrum is the fluctuation characteristics of the plasma at the moment of recombination. And why it's called recombination as opposed to combination, I've never understood. But at the moment at which the photons escape, okay? So there's an enormous amount of information that you can extract from the height of the peaks, the relative, the absolute height, the relative height of the peaks, the distance between the peaks, the location of the peaks, all of that, inf all of those quantities you can turn around and pull out where, what the physics is that goes into that plasma. So for example, um, the geometry of the universe is very, very tightly constrained by the location of this first peak. Because you can compute the size of the sound horizon at the surface of last scattering, and you, can, you know how far away the surface of last scattering was. So you can actually measure, you can, it's a fairly straightforward calculation to write down what that physical distance should have been on the surface of last scattering, depending on the geometry of the universe, and what that angular distance will be on the sky when you measure it, depending on the geometry of the universe. And if the universe is flat, you expect the peak to be here, and you expect the peak to move in either direction, 
for geometries that are not flat. So this is one of the simplest things that you can pull out just immediately if you don't have really, really, really high fidelity data, like when I, this is what I did for my graduate thesis, we just have a few measurements just to be able to locate this peak. And now we have so much more, we can tell a ton more. Um, so the kinds of things you can pull out of this are the geometry, the age, the composition. So here's another one that's fairly easy to understand, right? The relative height of the compression maxima relative to the rarefaction maxima tells you a lot about the composition, okay? Because the depth of the potential well is driven by how much dark energy there is, sorry, dark matter there is. How much compression you get is driven by a combination of how much, how much what the photon content is, so how much photon pressure and how many baryons you have sitting in those dark matter potential wells. So you can tease this all out by measuring the location and the relative height of these various peaks. Um, so it's just, it's kind of amazing when you run models, and I, I didn't do this for this talk because there was a lot to cover, but you can run models for what happens if you tune these various knobs, you change the amount of dark energy, you change the amount, number of baryons, the amount, the amount of photons, and you can see the peaks move and the relative heights change and you can pull out of a fit to the data exactly what all these parameters are and you can measure them really exquisitely well. So where we are today in 2016 is kind of amazing. I mean, this is, this is where we are from the detection of the CMB um, you know, roughly 50 years ago to just the characterization of it in my professional lifetime, which I'm not that old, and you know, we've gone from bare, from not, when I was a graduate student, we didn't yet know where this first peak was, and now we've measured this all the way down to um, essentially the limit of what this spectrum is going to tell us. So from, from about here, this way, we are what's called cosmic variance limited. In other words, we have only one universe, so on the very largest scales, you don't have enough different places you can plop down your um, circles that I showed to be able to compute with enough statistical significance what this should be for a given model. Right? So that's why those error bars are big. It's not that the measurements are not good. It's that we just have one universe, and that's as well as we could ever hope to measure this. Um, out here, they're, these measurements are not cosmic variance limited, so we can still do better. And out here, only 10% of the sky has been measured, so we can still do quite a lot better there. But you see, the spectrum's falling off, and there's not that much more um, information that can be gleaned there. So from temperature anisotropies alone, so this is from the Planck satellite, which is the most up-to-date measurements. We know the universe is flat to within a lot less than a percent. We know the baryon content. I know these are kind of funny units, but this basically tells us the, the baryon content, the cold dark matter content, the optical depth to reionization. So in other words, how long did it take for the photons to get away? And something called the scalar, scalar spectral index, which tells you something about the initial conditions. And I don't want to get into that right now. <clears throat> in the bigger picture, we have a really good picture of what the baryon content is, the dark matter content, the dark energy content. We know the age. We know um, those other things are from the other lecture, so I'll let them go. And so basically, we have a really, really, really good picture of a lot of the overall parameters. But we can do a lot more. Okay, so we haven't even talked yet about what you can get from polarization. So I said we could measure temperature. We can measure fluctuations in temperature, and then we can measure the polarization. And polarization is generated by Thomson scattering only when free electrons are present, okay? So, and when you have a quadrupolar temperature anisotropy. So these conditions exist at the surface of last scattering. You have free electrons present. And then they happen again when the universe is reionized when the first stars turn on. So you have two times in the big picture history of the universe when the whole universe is in a state where you can produce polarization in the microwave background. So how does this work? So the basic idea is 
If you have a region over here that's colder, and another one over here that's colder, and a region over here that's hotter, and another one over there that's hotter, over there that's hotter, the idea is that if a photon comes unpolarized, so from this direction and that direction with a large amplitude, and it comes unpolarized from this direction and that direction with a smaller amplitude, then the scattered photon will be linearly polarized. So you pick up a polarization on that scattering event, and you get it where those quadrupolar anisotropies exist. So the polarization um, has a couple of different, you can characterize it in a number of different ways. But one way you can do by analogy to <clears throat> electromagnetic fields, E fields and B fields, you can write down something called an E mode or a B mode. These are spatial um, quantities on the sky, so they're spatial patterns on the sky, and they're non-local quantities, meaning you can't compute e, an E mode or B mode for an individual point. You have to look at the pattern on the sky to tell you whether you're talking about an E mode or a B mode. And for those of you who think about polarization, on, the, on an individual point, you're measuring a Stokes vector, a Q or a U, and then over a pattern, you measure all, a whole bunch of those, and you can compute what the large-scale pattern looks like. So you can, again, expand those into spherical harmonics the way we did with the temperature anisotropies. And you can look at the spectrum that you get out of the polarization anisotropy spectrum. So why do we care? Why is that interesting? Well, there are two different types of physics um, that produce polarization. So you have quadrupolar anisotropies in the temperature anisotropy just because of density fluctuations. So forget any crazy physics, just the density and homogeneities that we've talked about already produce the kind of conditions that I was just saying. So if you just had density fluctuations alone, you would see polarization patterns on the CMB, and those polarization patterns would have this kind of characteristic, okay? Curl-free positive parity fluctuations. Um, and we call those an e, the E-mode um, type of fluctuations. These type of fluctuations require some kind of process that has a handedness associated with it, which means you don't get those kind of fluctuations from anything that is just a simple scalar kind of interaction. So just density and homogeneities cannot produce anything that looks like this. So these divergence-free or negative parity modes, you have to get some other way. So how might you think about getting something like that? So if in the early universe you have this inflationary epoch, and if during that inflationary epoch you have gravitational waves that are generated, which is what inflation predicts, then oops, those gravitational waves produce both E modes and also B modes. So there is a signature that comes from the inflationary epoch that's predicted to be there. We've not yet detected it. But that is at least in principle separable because it's a distinct signature from the E mode signature that is dominant. So you expect gravitational waves to produce both E modes and B modes. You never expect to see the E modes because they're buried in the E modes that you see from the density and homogeneities. But that's okay because if you can measure the B modes and know that that's what you're measuring and don't get fooled, then you can see the signature of the gravitational waves. And the basic idea here that makes this interesting is that the inflationary energy scale is directly proportion proportional to the level of B mode polarization that you detect. And it's parameterized by something called the tensor to scalar ratio. Otherwise, in other words, the amount of power produced by a gravitational wave related to the amount of power produced in the debt from the density in homogeneities. And the goal is to be able to get to a high enough level of sensitivity to measure that parameter R, 
and actually detect the signature, that B-mode signature of the gravitational waves. This, if we can do that, that tells you the energy scale at which inflation happened. It tells you that indeed inflation happened, that the model is correct. And it lets you explore the physics at energy scales that are orders of many orders of magnitude higher than you could ever hope to do in a terrestrial laboratory. So it gives you a window into fundamental physics that you can't get from building the biggest particle accelerator you can imagine building. So it's not just astrophysics, it's not just cosmology, it's really fundamental physics that you're probing by going after this signature. Problem is it's really, really small, so it's hard. Um, but we'll talk, I'll talk about experimentally how, how we go about doing that. But first I want to t say a few words about why it's actually not only hard because it's small, but hard because it's complicated. There are other ways to generate B modes. So if you take E mode, density inhomogeneities, so the polarization produced by density inhomogeneities, and you let them travel through the universe to us, there's stuff in the universe. And that stuff in the universe can gravitationally lens the E modes and turn them into B modes. That's a big drag. <laughs> but it's not only a drag, right, because it allows you to find a B mode signature that you know has to be there. So the E modes you know have to be there. And the B mode lensing you know has to be there. So if you want to design an experiment and you want to separate them, you, you have to ask, well, what do these spectra look like? So here is what you expect from the E mode spectrum. Okay, so that's what it looks like. This bump comes from reionization. And I mean, this is, this, is, this is the secondary polarization you get from reionization over here, but it's imprinted in the cosmic microwave background. So it's still an interesting signature that you can look for. Here is the B-mode lensing spectra. So this is what happens if you take E-modes and you lens them. And this blue, the set of blue curves are what you would expect given different inflationary models, different energy scales for inflation, for what you would expect the primordial spectrum to look like. So it's this blue one that we're interested in. And the green one, in some ways, is sort of our calibrator if you want to think of it that way. It's also a measurement of large-scale structure. So it doesn't have to just be a drag, but it does complicate things. So this is a messy plot. Um, and I just, want to, I just wanted to show this one very quickly, just to show you the level of complexity that you're talking about. So this is the temperature anisotropy spectrum that's been so nicely measured. This is a, a log y-axis, which means that the, this spectrum down here is many orders of magnitude smaller than that temperature spectrum we've measured. And it's many orders of magnitude smaller than the E-mode spectrum. So it's a really tough thing to measure. And that's why it's taking a long time to do it. But we're, we're starting to get close. But the idea is, if you measure E-modes, you can break degeneracies in some of these cosmological parameters, like the age, like the baryon content, like the neutrino content, et cetera, in the temperature anisotropy spectrum. The lensing B modes give you a picture of that large scale structure through which the microwave background photon has traveled. So you can learn things about the sum of the neutrino masses, about the development of large scale structure, et cetera, by measuring the lensing B modes. So they're not just a nuisance. And then these inflationary gravity waves these are really where it's at. This is really the, the most powerful plural of inflation. So that's what we're going after. So here is where we are so far. <clears throat> so the E-mode spectrum has actually been very nicely mapped out. You see all of these peaks. Um, you can see that as you go down to larger angular scales, things get the data peters out. That's because it's hard. It's harder to measure the entire sky than it is to measure fluctuations on a small piece of sky, which is something you can do with a ground-based telescope, for example. Um, so E-modes are nicely mapped out. The lensing B-modes had been detected. And some other B-modes were detected. And there was a big announcement in the press 
that these B modes were detected. And there was a press conference, and there were every major news article wrote about this. And this team said, we did it. And then a few days later, there was a question about what actually did that team do. And this was a really interesting example, I think, and something I, I pulled up not just because I want to make fun of that team, which is not the goal, but to say that the LIGO experiment that we talked about in the previous lecture, if anyone was here, um, the first detection of gravitational waves, classy operation, right? They wrote a paper. They submitted it to a peer-reviewed peer -review journal. They got it reviewed. It came back. It was published. And then they held a press conference and said, look what we saw. These guys, not so much, right? What happened here is they, they claim they detected it. And they hadn't even figured out what journal they were going to submit the paper to. So what happens is the whole community says, well, wait a minute. Did you really get this? And all the other data, everyone pours in with all their other data and says, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. That's not what happened. And it's a really good example of how science works <laughs> in, in physics. Because it's a simple problem. It might be a hard problem, but it's a simple problem. And a lot of people working on the same problem, very different from in medicine, for example, where everyone's got a different sample. They're working on a different problem. They have a zillion variables, and it's very difficult to tease out what's what. In a case like this, everyone's going after the same thing. And if someone measures something that doesn't make sense, everybody says, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense, and here's why. And there's a very fast correction. So it's very interesting from a, a science um, progress standpoint, just to think about the way that works in different fields. So what happened? So what happened was they detected B modes from dust in our galaxy. So foregrounds, right? This is what they were trying to get. And instead, they saw our own galaxy. So I want to talk a little bit about why our own galaxy makes this difficult in addition to all of the large scale structure, and then what you can do about it. So just coming back, OK, here's the big picture. We have the inflationary paradigm. You have the production of the cosmic microwave background. You have Thomson scattering that gives you CMB polarization. You have density perturbations giving you E modes. You have potentially gravitational waves giving you B modes. Then you get the dark ages. Then you get reionization. Then you get mixing. And you have to see all of that through our galaxy, because that's where we live. And in our galaxy is dust and synchrotron radiation and all kinds of other stuff that astronomers work on and think about. And for us, it's just a big nuisance foreground, but we still have to deal with it. So here's the level of challenge. Right? So if you're looking at 90% of the sky, this is the level of foregrounds that you expect. If you're looking at a small percentage of the sky, just 1% of the sky, you can do that because the fluctuations are uniform everywhere. So you can compute these statistical fluctuations from a measurement of a small piece of sky. That's OK. Right? Even, and, then, and then you're free to look at the galactic dust map and look at the galactic synchrotron map and pick the cleanest region and just look at that. So we got away with that for a long time for temperature anisotropies. We got away with it because we could drill down in the clean regions, and the foregrounds weren't that big. And it was kind of surprising for how long we got away with it. right? But even at the 1% level, this is the level of foregrounds. And indeed, that's what they measured. right? They measured that. So why did they not know they were measuring that? Um, I personally actually think they should have. I mean, the minute they announced it, I said, well, what about foregrounds? And so did everybody else. So I, I, I think it, was not ex it wasn't the most professional thing. But <clears throat> they, they didn't, what they didn't do was measure enough frequencies. And we'll talk about why. But what they did do was say, oh, well, the models show that the foreground shouldn't be that high. And so therefore, it's OK. Um, and it's true. The models were incomplete. We didn't have detailed models of what the foreground should look like because it's really hard. So how hard is this? How hard is doing this from the ground or even from a balloon? But I'll talk about the difference between ground and balloon. So to get the energy scale of inflation, you need to measure this parameter r um, to something like 0.001. <coughs> which means we need to measure the power spectrum at the level of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 
the noise in the map domain that corresponds to that level is something like 1 to 10 nanokelvin, which requires atmospheric rejection and control of instrumental systematics at the part at one part in 10 to the 11 of the 300 Kelvin atmosphere. So you really better know what you're doing in your experiment. You really better know what your experiment's doing, and you really better know what you're looking at, what you're measuring. No one has demonstrated that you are close to this level, and this has not even been done from the cleanest environments of space. So another way to look at foregrounds are in a different plot. This is temperature, this is rather than looking at power as a function of angular scale, this is power as a function of frequency. And now you can see how one might hope to separate foregrounds from the signal you're interested in. So the green signal is the expected signal from the gravitational wave signature. So this is amount of power as a function of frequency now, which is why the, the shape looks different. And this is the shape for synchrotron, and this is the shape for galactic dust. So you can see that if you had a spectrometer and you could measure the entire frequency spectrum really nicely, you could, you could separate these infinitely well. There's no fundamental reason, there's no fundamental problem. The problem is these experiments are really hard to build and every channel, every channel you get is gold, right? And every photon you get is gold. And so what we do instead of measuring an entire spectrum, which would be great, is you measure bands. So you have an experiment that looks at, you know, this band, right? It integrates all of the photon in this band. So let me tell you what's in these plots first. This is atmospheric transmission. So this is how much power gets through as a function of frequency if you're building an experiment on the ground to look out at the cosmos. And you can see that the atmospheric transmission <clears throat> gets better and worse depending on what frequency. And this is because you have different atomic lines and you have water lines and oxygen lines and you want to look in the regions of the frequency spectrum where you're not getting a lot of emission and absorption from those things. So this is what the actual spectrum looks like. The red is what you would expect from one of the best sites in the world and the blue is from the, uh, the other best site in the world. And the green is what you get if you're on a uh, stratospheric balloon. So this is a balloon-centric slide, but it shows you you can actually get up above most of this stuff if you choose to work instead of from a ground-based instrument, from a balloon-borne instrument. So then this is what that say, these same curves look like if you integrate over a bandwidth that's typical of an instrument. So it, you know, 30% bandwidth-ish. 25%, 30% bandwidth. So this is what that spectrum looks like. And these are the atmospheric windows in which these measurements are traditionally done on the ground. So that's sort of, those are your, that's your tool chest. Um, so the signal is both attenuated by the need to pass through the atmosphere and noise gets added by the atmosphere to your measurement. So it's sort of a double hit. And you also have atmospheric turbulence that creates fluctuations that add not just white noise, but also 1 over F noise to your measurements. So ideally, you'd be up above the atmosphere. And really, ideally, you would be on a satellite. Because the nice thing about satellites is you have a lot of observing time. You have incredible thermal stability. You have the whole sky with nothing in your way. Um, and you can build an instrument that's very, very, very well controlled. The not nice thing about satellites is they're enormously expensive and you get to build one at most every 10 years. And even then, you're lucky. So the, the history of the field is a bunch of ground-based measurements, a bunch of balloon-borne measurements, a satellite, repeat. Right? So um, I want to give you an example of one of the projects that I'm working on. Um, that is a balloon-borne experiment, and just talk a little bit about why balloons, because balloons on the face of it are a really insane thing to do. You have to be crazy to fly a scientific balloon, because here's how it works. You get a shoestring budget to build a 6,000-pound telescope over a period of seven years, and you build it with graduate students and postdocs and faculty who are really smart, but are not engineers and not technicians, 
and you tape it together with duct tape and you wire, you know, you plug it together yourself. And then you go and you launch it into the stratosphere and you build all your own communication hardware and all of your own software for talking to it. And anything that goes wrong, you're dead. Dead. Over. Because you can't, you can't touch it. It's gone. And then it comes down and if, you get, if you're lucky, seven, year, seven years later, you get to do another one. So you have to be crazy. And you only get about 10 days to two weeks of observing time. Um, so those of us who do this are kind of crazy. And I, you know, my first project as a graduate student was a balloon project. And after we were done, I went to my advisor and I said, so I really want to work with you, but I really don't want my thesis to be reliant on this whole balloon thing. And he said, don't worry, we're doing a ground-based project next. So you can write your thesis on a ground-based project. So I said, OK, that sounds better. Um, and then insanely, once I got tenure, I went off and started doing this again. Um, but there are some good things. Okay, You avoid the atmospheric loading. You avoid the atmospheric attenuation. You get cleaner access to the large angular scales. So remember when I was showing you where we are on the data, it's the large scales where the action is, and it's the large scales that are the hardest to measure. So balloons make that easier. Um, also, when you think about observing time, if you're on the ground, you can observe for two years. And if your telescope breaks, you drive up to the mountain and you fix it. And it's not a big deal, right? If your balloon breaks, like I said, not so good. But on the other hand, this is a busy plot, and I don't expect you to understand, I don't bother with any of the stuff in the middle. But look at this and look at that, okay? So what this is showing is for a reasonable amount of water vapor on the ground from one of the best sites in the world, the equivalent number of days, so number of years you would have to observe on the ground for a 20-day flight, and this assumes on this column, it assumes that you have 100% observing time, so you're observing every day. And this, observe, this assumes you're observing something like 200 days, which is much more realistic in terms of duty cycle for a typical CMB telescope. You have bad weather, something breaks, you have to change something, you have to cycle something, so it's, this is much more realistic. So you're talking about for a 20-day flight, you can get the equivalent at the lowest frequencies of six years or so of observing. And at the highest frequencies, where the, ground, where the atmosphere is the worst, you can get the equivalent of 40 years of observing. So it's kind of, you can kind of see why, other than me being nuts, why you might think that this is a good idea. Because you can actually, if it all goes right, you can really get a lot done in a very short period of time. The, also, the other thing with balloons is that up here at the high, whoops, up here at the high frequency end, um, you really can't observe from the ground because at the highest frequencies, there's just too much atmospheric loading. And for the really, really, really sensitive um, detectors you need to try to go up and observe at 400 gigahertz or, th or even 300 gigahertz is really, really, really tough. So you can get complementary observations, which means you can probe a region of this spectrum that's very difficult to do from the ground, which gives you really valuable information about separating out synchrotron from dust from the signal that you're actually interested in. So it's actually, it's actually pretty important that you have that complementarity. So I'll just run you really briefly, lightning quick, through what one of these experiments looks like. Um, and I've worked on a bunch of these. This is just one. Um, but it'll give you a picture of the flavor of how this kind of science is done. So this is roughly the size of the collaboration. Um, two major institutions, Columbia and University of Minnesota, and then a lot of smaller institutions that, that work with us on the project. This is what the beast looks like. So this is integrating the whole thing at my lab at, um, up in Westchester. So this is very busy, but the basic idea is the microwave light comes in, it hits this primary mirror, goes in and hits the secondary mirror, comes down into this big tub of a cryostat, and that's where the camera lives. So essentially, this is the camera. This is a person, so a person is much smaller than a camera. Um, you can see up here, this is the thing that attaches it to the balloon. There's suspension cables. There's all kinds of junk and a whole bunch of navigation stuff. So you have GPS, you have magnetometers, you have sun sensors, you have star cameras, all kinds of stuff to tell you where you're looking. 
Um, if, you, if you go down, so now, now we go inside the cryostat, you can see there's a bunch of optical elements here. Um, the most important ones are that there's a half wave plate that sits here that rotates the polarization. So as the light comes in, you rotate the polarization with this rotating half wave plate, which means that both focal planes, where you have detectors there and also there, on a short time scale, see both polarizations. So you can difference the detectors to reduce the noise and, and pull out signals that are not the signals you want. So here is what this thing looks like closer up. So this is the cartoon. This is the optics box right there that sits inside the cryostat. Um, this is the actual hardware. So this is where the light comes in. There are some lenses. There's a polarizing grid that sends one polarization there and one polarization here. Um, and here is the, the big beast ready to go onto the telescope. The detectors are what are called transition edge sensitive bolometers. They're superconducting detectors that are enormously sensitive to tiny, tiny changes in the photon intensity or photon temperature. And they're read out using something called a squid, uh, um, a little microwave, a little, uh, little resonator. So this, if you go, this is the whole array, then you can pull out one of these guys. This is, this is what one little bolometer looks like. <clears throat> this is where the focal plane hardware lives. So this is that polarizing grid. Right down in here is where the detectors go. And here's some of the hardware as it's actually getting put together. That is the half wave plate. You can see it's what's called an achromatic half wave plate. So it's designed to operate all the way from um, about 120-ish gigahertz all the way up to about 450. So you can have one element in front of a whole bunch of different frequencies. So here's what the um, first launch looks like. You put this all together. You have to go and do an engineering launch. So we launched in North America first to just prove the instrument works, and then you recover it. Just a short one-day flight, make sure things work. Um, this is what the public saw. Um, we had a number of UFO detections, and there was a blog, and there was a, there was a bunch of controversy. There was you know, we, a bunch of people writing, did you see the UFO? I saw the UFO. And one of our graduate students got on there and said, no, 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 it's not a UFO. Here's a picture of the telescope. It was launched by NASA. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what NASA always wants you to think. <laughs> and you actually put a sticker on your telescope that says something to the effect of, this is not a UFO. Please do not shoot it with your shotgun. Uh, we will come and pick it up if it lands in your ranch. <laughs> because the deal is you can't fly these things where there are a lot of people. Because there's something they call the zone of death, which means that if there's more than one, part, one chance in a million of it landing on a person or a house, you can't fly. So there's only regions in the Southwest where you're allowed to fly. Cows apparently are OK. If it lands on a cow, it's OK. Um, but so the idea is that you have to go and recover it. So that's, that's what it looked like there. Then we were all ready to go. So you get it ready to ship to Antarctica. Um, the sequence of events is the cryostat ships off to Palestine. The, you cool it down. You make sure it works. It comes from one institution. Then as soon as that's all ready to go, the telescope comes from the other institution. You put it together. There we are. It's all getting ready to go. And then some weird stuff happened. So my daughter was born May 20th, 2012. 10 days later, here's a headline that I was not at all pleased to see. The telescope disappeared. Poof, gone. Seven years of work, the telescope is missing. So a little backstory. So we have friendly rivalry between the two teams at Minnesota and Columbia, I had gotten a phone call from my collaborator in Minnesota saying, I just saw the, the charges for your trucking company. You really, you really hired an expensive trucking company. You should use our trucking company. They are much cheaper. And I said, no, they, you know, they, we, we trust these guys. They're willing to go into New York. I, 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 got, I got an earful. Well, it turns out that his guy was the one where the telescope went missing. And when they found it, it turned out that the trucker was some sort of a meth addict. He had gotten in over his head in debt. His 
Um, <laughs> the guys who he, to whom he owed money confiscated his truck in payment for the meth that he had not paid for. And then he found out that the FBI was actually looking for this. And the FBI got involved because it was a federally funded experiment to the tune of millions of dollars. So when it was reported missing, the FBI got interested. And then when he opened it up and realized it wasn't a, you know, a whole bunch of Dell computers that he could sell on the black market, but instead, what the hell is that? And the FBI are looking for me. He abandoned it in a Walmart parking lot and we got it back. <laughs> um, so here's what it looks like about to fly. Um, and here is the track that the telescope took. Um, and here are some preliminary maps of what we saw, and we are analyzing those now. Um, and because we have about five more minutes, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go on and show one little scientific surprise that's been kind of fun. So um, another thing that's really good that I just, I always put in here, and I'm just gonna kind of go by this, is that testing technology in space-like conditions is essential for satellites. And you cannot do that on the ground. So even if you didn't get the best science in the world from balloons, which sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, you have to be able to do this. So for example, the kind of detectors that we're gonna fly on the next round, these things are called um, sinuous antenna multicroic pixels, similar to what we flew before, but much, much more sophisticated. They are the baseline detectors for one of the next generation satellites. If we don't get those on the sky, there's trouble, right? So we, you, the balloon program is, is good for that too. And then the last thing is sometimes you get a little bit of a surprise. And this, is, this, was, this has been something that's been so fun for me over the last year and a half or two years is to learn about completely different physics, completely different. So here's what happened. So on the telescope, there are these little cameras um, that are designed, there's one here and there's one on the other side. And they are star cameras. They are designed, they're little telescopes. They're designed to take a picture of the sky and to look at, to, to identify a bunch of stars and then to do a very quick pattern match and tell you where you're looking. So to within a couple of arc seconds, anytime the telescope is stationary enough to snap a nice picture, you know exactly where you're looking. That's it. Really important, because if you don't know where you're looking, you're not making a good map. So you, you got to get this right. But there was no science in there other than just get the map right. But I had a graduate student who was really smart, who's now gone off to work at SpaceX, and he's launching satellites. And he over the hell out of the software. And he said, I want to bring down all the images. We don't want to just store our locations. We want to we want to bring down the images, because what if the camera goes out of focus or we lose communication, and we want to reconstruct later? So I said, fine, if you can get the images down, I'd love to have them, great. So here's what we expected to see in those images. And there's what we saw instead. Um, this is a, a sample of eight of about 40,000 images with this crazy patterns in them. Anyone have any idea what these are? Is it no? Any idea? So this is the kind of conversation we had in my research group when we looked at those. Um, but the, nope. Um, so, but you're a lot closer. So I got in touch with people I knew in the, um, up at Lamont Earth Observatory who work in atmospheric science. And I said, hey, we saw this weird stuff. Anyone have an idea what it is? And someone said, oh, I think those are polar mesospheric clouds. Polar mesospheric clouds are these tiny little ice crystals that form at 85 kilometers up. Most clouds form at one or two kilometers, so way up there. We are flying in the stratosphere. The mesosphere is above the stratosphere, so we're flying right beneath this layer. During the polar summer, for a period of just a few months, peaking, coincidentally, exactly when we flew, these, th that region of the mesosphere becomes the coldest place on Earth during this period of time in the summer, oddly, counterintuitively. And these little ice crystals nucleate around cosmic dust in the atmosphere, and they create this very thin layer of clouds. And it turns out that 
The, from the surface of the Earth, there are buoyancy waves, which are referred to as gravity waves, very confusingly, nothing to do with what we've been talking about. These buoyancy waves that travel up through the atmosphere, and when they get to the mesosphere is when they preferentially, when they break, because the thickness, the, the density of the atmosphere goes, it just happens to be that that's where they tend to break. And they leave, in, and that's where these clouds tend to form. And so the buoyancy waves deposit their energy and momentum preferentially, not exclusively, but preferentially in this region. And you can see what's going on by looking at the clouds. The reason this is interesting is that people have been trying to study these clouds and the patterns in these clouds for a long time using LIDAR and ground-based observations because um, the integrated process of, of the, of the um, travel of these buoyancy waves through the atmosphere tells you a lot about the atmospheric physics you need to understand climate models and weather models. And the scales that we observed are missing scales. Right? They were only able to observe with all the existing instruments these very large scales. So one of these images fits within a single pixel of the dedicated satellite that was designed to study these things. And we have coincident measurements on the tiny scales with the satellite that measured them on the large scales. So we, this, this is a window, a brand new window, into studying the atmosphere that, that may eventually have um, quite a lot to do with better parameterizations of climate and weather models. So we just got a brand new experiment funded with an atmospheric team to go and do more of this. So that's been, been really fun, just an aside. Um, so the future of CMB is, is really, like a lot of fields, we're moving to bigger and bigger projects. So the, the EBEX experiment that I was talking about is a team of sort of tens of people. And we're going to big projects. So this is the big coordinated ground-based experiment of which I'm a part. Um, you know, we've, we've been working on putting this together over the past six months or a year called S4. And this is going to be a coordinated set of telescopes in a bunch of different locations, really doubling down and trying to get that signature. At the same time, I'm leading this NASA group, really looking at trying to figure out how to get a satellite funded for the next generation. Um, sorry, that's over here, and, and really trying to keep people remembering that we got to, even though we're really, and you know, I'm very much part of these two things, so I'm not partial, but we got to keep the ballooning program too because they all fit together. So I think over the next decade, there's going to be a lot of really interesting stuff, and we might even see our version of the gravitational waves someday, but it's yet to be seen. So I'll stop there. Thank you.